Right. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, today, uh, our assignment will be to look at two major aspects of Tom Jones. The first is to take a look at and it is that I would like to uh, now make a presentation uh, or present my screen uh, to all of you. Is my screen visible? Is screen visible? No, sir. No, sir. Not, yet. Not yet. I can't hear. One of you, please. It is not visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible. It is visible, right? OK. Right. Thank you. Uh, now, when we talk about characterization tools, we need to understand that fielding, when he's talking about the comic epic poem in prose, is undertaking two very important departures in terms of characterization in the novel. One is that he is bringing in characters from all classes, but most importantly, he's building in, bringing in characters from the lower classes as part of the structure of the novel and the content of the novel. This is point number one. And secondly, he is talking about, or he's bringing into uh, the ambit of the novel, the unheroic hero, in the sense that Fielding is, through his characters, problematizing the concept of virtue. And I referred in my earlier discussion to the fact that the novel was departing from the romance in sort of presenting what you can call gray characters, characters who are mixed rather than characters who are either very good or very bad, right? Evil or good. So this very concept of notion of virtue within characterization is an aspect that is that is brought into the ambit of discussion by Field. And therefore, Fielding says, as you can see on that screen, uh, it was necessary to draw naturals. Just give me a moment. To draw naturals, not perfect characters. Right, so unheroic in sense number four, one, that they belong to the classes hitherto not represented in fiction. Right. So they are their class identities. Of course, Tom being uh, the person who does not have an identity at all. Therefore, the foundling is almost outside the, the pale of, of characterization itself. So to draw naturals and secondly, you know, problematizing virtue, draw, drawing nature, human nature as it is, right? In shades of gray, not perfect characters, and to record the truths of history, not the extravagances of romance. Now, that's a very important statement that feeling is making, that he will not draw the idealized characters of romance, but he will draw the realistic characters of history, right? And secondly, he's making the statement about class. Why does he bring in characters from the, uh, the lower classes? He says, I'll venture to say that the highest life is much the dullest and offers very little humor or entertainment. The various callings in the lower spheres produce the great variety of humorous characters, right? So he's going back to this idea of comedy and the way in which, you see, uh, the characters from the lower classes produce the greater variety of incident. So that is required for the dense action of the novel. And secondly, that this also leads to 
the greater number of humorous incidents, right? So incidents that may provoke laughter and mirth and enjoyment. Now, at the heart of this, of course, you will obviously realize is this idea that the novel was directed towards pleasure, right? That the novel was directed towards pleasure. So in the production of pleasure, you know, incidents which are or characters who are perfect produce very little entertainment value as it were and therefore it is necessary to uh, to draw characters who are much more uh, you know vigorous and belong to the lower classes so two very important departures one is the inclusivity of the novel and especially the inclusion of the lower class characters and secondly there's this question about the uh, the problematization of virtue that is to say that he's not drawing perfect characters but a blended character now the next major point that he however does having said that is fielding's characterization uses two different kinds of character now those of you of course who remember and have studied this notion of character in the novel will remember the major theoretical work of E.M. Foster. The Foster, of course, divides character into two different kinds. The first is he talks about uh, the flat characters and he talks about the round characters. So the flat characters who are as it were types and secondly, the round characters which keep on developing within the novel. Now, in this particular novel, Fielding also introduces a series of what I will call walking concepts or flat characters. Right. Who are these characters? For example, Squire Allward, somebody who is the example of the perfect squire, the perfection of human nature, judgment, generosity and prudence brought together. Squire Wester, who is a representative of the lower body, right? The anarchic lower body. If Allworthy is the cerebral moral center of the novel, then Western is the destabilizing carnivalesque alternative center of the text. Also, take characters like Thwackham who represents the Calvinist position of punishment as a way of reforming human nature. Or Square, who also articulates the deist position that everything that is, is according to a plan of God. Right. Therefore, these are the walking concepts who are, as it were, flat characters who represent certain static positions. Now, the two characters in the novel who articulate, as it were, the round character position are even Bliffel. I'll come to Bliffel a little later on. But the two characters who emerge and develop from within the novel are Tom. And this is Tom's journey, the character of the Bildungsroman, who moves from, as it were, uh, innocence, not exactly innocence, but who moves and grows throughout the novel towards students. This is one. And the other is that of Sophia, who also grows towards prudence. So these are the two round characters within Tom Jones. Now, of course, Tom's movement is deliberately from the anarchic Western he surrenders to his desires, if you remember, the three Peve uh, uh, Fatals who trap Tom, as it were, moves from the position of Western, the anarchic Western, the bodily Western, to the cerebral and prudent Allworthy. So that is the 
movement of character within Tom. But importantly, there's also this question of illegitimacy. Now, Tom's status is that of a foundling who does not have an identity at all. So in a certain sense, this novel is also about the search for identity and the question of the identity of the illegitimate uh, individual, as it were. So why is this important? Because of rampant, you know, uh, abandoned children, illegitimate children were an important problem, a social problem in England. And therefore, Fielding is also bringing into the ambit of characterization this question of illegitimacy. Of course, you will understand that at the end of the novel, uh, the illegitimate child turns out to be legitimate after all, and the inheritor of the Allward, the estate. But that is a wish-fulfilling ending. Fielding is drawing our attention to this problem of illegitimacy. Right. Now, at the same time, while Fielding is creating these walking concepts and when we talk about Tom's growth from desire to prudence there is always a mock heroic parody of any such assumption how does this operate take the example of square for example square who is a moral deist has no qualms about slipping into bed with Molly Seagram. So, Fielding is, as it were, pointing out to the hypocritical positions of human individuals who violate their principles. This is one. Secondly, Fielding deliberately creates certain epic parallels. For example, when he introduces Sophia Western, he introduces her as a paragon of beauty, but then immediately comments that Sophia, the daughter of Western, was middlingly tall, right? So he's praised Sophia as the paragon of beauty, Hellenic, and so on and so forth, and then immediately undercut and made her quite ordinary. So there is a certain mock heroic parody within this notion of, of characterization. Very importantly, Fielding's notion of characterization leads, I am going to argue, to a broader philosophical debate about good nature. Right. Now, what is good nature? That is the most important debate within the novel. And Fielding suggests, you know, that good nature is not always perfection. Good nature is an ideal to strive for, but it is not always perfected. And therefore he writes, we must admonish thee, my worthy friend, this is to the reader, not to condemn a character as a bad one because it is not perfectly a good one. So Fielding is arguing that there is nothing called perfect good nature in an individual. There are always pitfalls. And therefore, good nature is an ideal to strive for. How does you know, good nature, how is good nature defined? That's what Fielding is trying to tell us. He says, good nature is that benevolent and amiable temper of mind so point number one is benevolence of charity, the greatest virtue, which disposes us to feel the misfortunes and enjoy the happiness of others and consequently pushes us on to promote the latter and prevent the former and that without any abstract contemplation on the beauty of virtue and without the allurements of the terror of religion. So he's suggesting that it is a natural benevolence rather than any artificial philosophy or the fear of religion. Artificial philosophy is something that Square believes in. 
the terrors of religion is something that Thwackam believes in. And therefore, good nature is natural benevolence, which Tom has, Allworthy has, Blifil does not have, Square does not have, Thwackam does not have. In Square's vocabulary, you know, religion is marginalized. And he says, I'll maintain that the natural beauty of virtue may exist independent of any religion whatsoever. And Thwackam suggests that only punishment, when I mean religion, I mean the Christian religion, not only the Christian religion, the Protestant religion, not only the Protestant religion, but the Church of England. So these are narrower definitions of good nature, which Fielding does not agree with. So benevolence is something that charity, caritas, is what Tom possesses, all worthy possesses. But benevolence alone does not make good nature. It must be combined with the idea of prudence. And therefore, Fielding writes, let this, my young readers, be your constant maxim that no man can be good enough to enable him to neglect the rules of prudence, nor will virtue herself look beautiful unless she be bedecked with the outward ornaments of decency and decorum. So good nature is benevolence with prudence. Charity from within and judgment from outside. And then this is Allworthy. Allworthy tells Tom what dangers imprudence alone may subject. Prudence is indeed the duty we owe to ourselves. Right? So Allworthy says, because you were imprudent and you rushed into submission to your desires, you were almost on the verge of committing incest. Therefore, Tom's journey, as it were, is from controlling this imprudence to arriving at Allworthy's prudence. Therefore, Tom's journey is an allegorical journey of virtue, moving towards truth and beauty, embodied in Sophia through the correction of imprudent decisions. So Sophia is truth, and that truth can be attained only with prudence and benevolence. Right. So this is the ideal conception of character that Fielding is moving towards. How about Blifil? Now, Blifil, what is the antithesis of benevolence? The antithesis of benevolence is hypocrisy, affectation, and envy. Hypocrisy, affectation, and envy. Blifil possesses cunning, so he possesses intelligence, but that is not moral intelligence, that is cunning, low cunning, lacks in virtue, and hence is dismissed as a hypocrite. Therefore, Allworthy dismisses Blifil because he's villainous. Villainy, my boy, when once discovered, is irretrievable. So this is where Blifil becomes evil. The stains which this leaves behind, no time will wash away. And therefore, Tom suggests that he's, he has surrendered to desire, but he has not harmed anybody. So I have been guilty with women, I own it, but not conscious that I have injured any. Nor would I, to procure pleasure to myself, be knowingly the cause of misery in any human being. Right. So the Tom and Blifil are antithetical. Tom lacks prudence but has benevolence and is therefore acceptable. Blifil has cunning but lacks benevolence and is envious and hypocritical. Therefore, he must be dismissed. Now, the question is the problem with such a formulation is where do we locate Squire Western, right? Now, as I have 
quoted Andrew Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, one of the earlier critics of Tom Jones, Wright made a very important point. He suggests that, you know, rather than Olworthy, it is Western who is the center of the action of the novel. And it, the relentless action is moved forward, not by moralizing of Olworthy, but by the sheer physical energy of Western and Tom. Now, let me remind you of uh, Isha Chandra Vidyashagor's uh, Borno Purichoy, which I'm sure many of uh, you who do not know even Bengali will remember. In Borno Purichoy, which is the primer, there are two boys, if you remember. And these two boys are Rahal and Gopal, right? And Gopal is a very good boy. And Rahal is a very naughty boy. But for the novel to exist, you know, you cannot have a novel about Ra uh, Gopal, or the good boy. You know, Richardson wanted to write about the perfect figure of virtue in Sir Charles Grandison. It failed at the box office. Because, you know, for the novel to constantly move forward, it needs adventure, it needs desire, it needs sexuality, it needs the lure of money. And therefore, Wright argues that it is Western and Tom, the body, sexuality, money, which is at the source of the energy of Tom Jones. Right. And therefore, he says, Wright also says that Western's attitude towards love is far more open. And there is a greater acknowledgement of the presence of sexuality within human life. You know, the statement being to suggest that Fielding, is, despite his conservative ending, is far more, you know, franker, is far more frank, is franker about sexuality and money than Richardson, who is the moralist. So instead of Allworthy, who seems artificial, Western seems to be the more livelier protagonist. And therefore, let me ask you this question. Are the two selves of Fielding engaged in a contest between a rogue and a scholar, a reformer and a prodigal, a classicist and a show business huckster, an athlete and an aesthete? Right? So this is for you to judge who is the moral center. We've said that, you know, Tom's journey is from Olworthy to Western, but the energy of the novel seems to be, you know, directed towards love and sexuality that Western brings to the text with Tom. You know, the moment Tom becomes Olworthy, the novel has to come to an end. Now, it is therefore that Fielding was attacked for being immoral. You have to understand whether this is a moral novel, although things seem to be that evil is punished and that Tom can move from the femme fatales to the virtuous woman in Sophia. There was an argument that in acknowledging this sexuality, describing it, fielding and describing these lower characters, fielding was immoral. And this was articulated by Dr. Johnson. You remember, Dr. Johnson was the yardstick of judgment, as it were, during this period. Dr. Johnson said that Fielding was a blockhead. He said he was a barren rascal. He says, will you not allow, sir, that he draws very natural pictures of human life? And Johnson says, why, sir, a very low life? Richardson used to say, that had he not known who Fielding was, he should have believed he was an ostler, somebody who looks after horses. So there's this argument that Fielding's language characterization is immoral and coarse. And therefore, Richardson elsewhere had chastised him for his gals, gals is jails, his sponging houses, his rakish heroes, and his profane novels. Right, novels that were frankly talking about sexuality and money. Right, so that then is the question of characterization. 
So if you ask the question on this, how Fielding presents the unheroic hero, you have to respond by going back to these points. In Tom Jones, Fielding presents a wide possible gallery of characters and unheroic characters, both in terms of class as well as in terms of morality. But he justifies this by arguing that the novel is dependent on its energy for the immoral characters or for the characters with dubious morality. And that, you know, the characters of lower life present much more exciting and pleasurable reading phenomena. He presents both round and flat characters, especially with certain walking concepts. Then you'll argue that his characters equally are presented in a mock heroic parodic mode, especially Square, even Sophia Western, Clackham, and the others. And that this characterization, therefore, has been critiqued as immoral and profane. At the same time, you will then argue that this characterization looks forward or leads us into the moral debate within the novel on the question of good nature. And good nature, in dealing with good nature, fielding is creating a kind of combination of benevolence and prudence. And it's rejecting hypocrisy, affectation, and envy. And it is therefore that you can argue that Tom and Allworthy, therefore, and that therefore within this novel, Tom and Allworthy represent one group, whilst Griffith and the others represent another. You could also argue that there is the presence of the opposition between the moral and the carnivalist in the novel, and that Allworthy represents the moral, whilst the carnivalist is represented by the uh, by Square Western, and ultimately the journey is from the carnivalesque to the moral, right? So that is all about the characterization in Tom Jones. Now I will now move on to a slightly different issue. I'll talk about the prefatory chapters within the novel, right? Now I have pointed out that within Tom Jones, we actually have 18 separate prefatory chapters. So what are these prefatory chapters? These are dialogues or direct interfaces between the author and the reader. So while Fielding is talking about or Fielding is narrating the tale, it's equally narrating another story about the relationship between the novelist and the reader. Now, why is this elaborate story or elaborate counter narrative, parallel narrative necessary? Now, it might be that in the absence of any critical discourse in fiction, Fielding is using these chapters to articulate his ideas on the new province of writing. So these prefatory chapters are a way of addressing the concerns of the new genre that is emerging. Therefore, Fielding is both narrating a tale as well as theorizing on the narrative. What are the concerns? The definition of the genre, which we have already seen, comic epic poem in prose. The definition of the readership and the notion of the novel as a commodity. I will come to these points by and by. The definition of the new protagonist, which we just saw, why is the unheroic hero necessary and what does he mean by the unheroic hero? Establishing the codes of realism, 
and the changing nature of the author reader relationship right so let me come to these points one by one how does fielding define the novel as a commodity he suggests that the novelist is like an innkeeper innkeeper as in a hotel keeper somebody who's running a restaurant and he says the author ought to consider himself not as a gentleman but rather as one who keeps a public ordinary so in a hotel you can go and have chicken soup you can have dal bhat you can equally have more masala right so whoever comes has to be catered to so the novel is seen as a kind of an amorphous commodity where people have different expectations some come to it for morality some come to it as a conduct book some come to it as pleasure so the novelist has to address these heterogeneous as it were components of of readerly demands right men who pay for what they will eat will insist on gratifying their palates however nice and whimsical these may prove and if everything is not agreeable to their taste will challenge a right to censure to abuse and to damn their dinner without control right so fielding is suggesting that the novel is a commodity which people are buying with their money and therefore the novelist has to satisfy the heterogeneous demands of the reader very important comment by the way when he defines the novel as a comic epic poem in prose equally suggesting that the novel is a commodity and the novelist is like an inky the second thing in continuity with this idea is the heterogeneity of readers we've just talked about the heterogeneity of readerly expectations but who are these readers now there are almost 42 times that fielding refers to different kinds of readers in tom jones right so the readers can be sensible reader sagacious reader classical reader good natured reader so these are the educated readers then comes the male reader the worthy reader so is acutely aware that there are men and women who have different expectations from the novel and then readers of the lowest class the upper graduates of criticism therefore the class identity of the readers and then finally is exasperated and concludes that reader it is impossible that we should know what sort of a person thou will be right so he's saying that i do not know in fact what kind of a person you are so it's acknowledging there the wide variety of not only readerly expectations but also the sheer number and identity of the readers then comes the question of the author as a tyrant so what does an author do he says i shall not look on myself as accountable to any court of critical jurisdiction for i am in reality the founder and that is a very important quote of a new province of writing so here for the first time mind you for the first time yesterday this question came up so for the first time somebody is acknowledging that yes i am writing something new self conscious so i am at liberty to make what laws i please therein right and he talks about himself like a de jure tyrant not merely a de facto tyrant but a de jure tyrant who can frame whatever laws he pleases within so what fielding is drawing attention to is the fact that he is the one writing the novel the novel is an artificial work of art and that the novel is something that is manufactured and consumed that this is not real that's very important even though it sort of even though it poses to be real 
it is in it is not reality right so then feeling talks about the codes of realism and he defines what the realist novel will be like and this is very important for you he says that when any extraordinary scene presents itself we shall spare no pains but if whole years should pass without producing anything worthy we shall hasten on to so saying i can take a leap in time that means to say i don't have to de describe event by event moment by moment so this concept that you had you know that's where you know the shakespeare criticism also comes in that you know the unity of time and place does not have to be maintained you know he can leap over moments of time and then he says we must keep within the rules of possibility and not only that also in terms of probability now for many of you these two terms might seem identical but they are not it might be that i might slip on the road and fall that's possible but if i'm a careful man it is not very probable so incidents must not only be possible but also probable and therein lies the importance of dowling in the novel that that letter showing tom's identity must not suddenly be manufactured it must be there somewhere it must be probable from within the novel so if you look at that corpus of plot within tom jones that is what is extraordinary and that is why coleridge suggests this that there are such a wide breadth density packed incidents yet at every turn all these are neatly linked together so causality probability possibility are elements that fielding brings into the fiction and it says if the historian will confine himself to what really happened he must be well assured he will sometimes fall into the marvelous but never into the incredible so coincidence might be possible but not something that is impossible the impossible is the realm of the romance you can have a dragon and be all fighting the romance a uh, dragon in a romance but at no point can the realist novel allow that there might be coincidence as you all have seen in the feeling in the fictions of hardy but it cannot be incredible right so that then is the importance of the prefatory chapters feeling is aware that he's writing a new form is creating a new form fielding is trying to define the new form in a hybrid sense as i pointed out in my one of my first slides comic epic poem written in prose so it's providing a definition it's providing the identity of characters what kind of characters are there how the novel is a commodity and how it has to satisfy heterogeneous readers is trying to define the readers of the novel and failing is trying to define the codes of realism of possibility and probability of the marvelous but not the incredible and is also justifying that the author is the one who is manipulating and has the absolute right to manipulate the incidents is therefore drawing attention our attention to the fact that this is a novel this is art this is not reality even though it uses and mimics reality it is therefore that you can see in its self consciousness in its drawing attention to itself building is one of the first post modernists who is operating with the novel showing us 
how he's playing with the form. And this playing with the form is equally important as the form itself. And therefore, when you go back to a text like John Fowles's The French Lieutenant's Woman, which I do not know if we'll have time to do, you can check out my lecture there, which is there on YouTube if you want to. In The French Lieutenant's Woman, Fowles is doing the exact same thing. He's narrating a story. At the same time, he's continuously questioning the story and saying and, and pointing out to himself, the author, who's sort of continuously manipulating the story, creating different endings. This is what Rushdie will be doing in Midnight's Children. This is what Stern will be doing in Tristram Shandy. This is what Joyce will be doing. And of course, a glut of postmodern authors, including Italo Calvino, and you have uh, a host of, if you, any of you read Borges or Carpentier, they will be talking about the writing, the story itself becomes the story. But in fielding, this is distributed. It is distributed between the story itself and the story of writing the story. Now, at that point of time, it was necessary for him to draw up the codes, to define his form, to define the modes that he would use. That was what Fielding was trying to do. And that is why the prefatory chapters remain an integral part of Tom Jones as the first theorizations of the English novel. So we've looked at two issues today. We've looked at the issue of characterization and the presentation of the unheroic hero in Fielding. We've equally looked at the importance of the prefatory chapters in Tom Jones. In our next class, we will talk about the major themes of Tom Jones. We'll talk about the question of the bastard, we'll talk about the representation of women, and we'll talk about the notion of property and the novel in our next class. And that will be sometime tomorrow. So thank you for your attention. In, uh, in this class, and I will hereby stop the recording now, and we can move on to your questions.